Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 14th of the 12th month on our Creator's calendar as we reckon it, which happens to line up with 25th of February, 2023. And we're right in the midst of the Feast of Purim. It's celebrated on this calendar today and tomorrow. So we thought we'd take a little break from Hanok still. and We haven't gone on it for the last couple of weeks now. But we'll get back to it as soon as we can. And we'll take a little segue and actually read through the account of what happened during this time where Yahuwah delivered his people while they were in captivity. Now, many of you might be familiar with the common version in the scriptures that are translated from the Masoretic text. There's actually some additional information. If you look at the Septuagint version or you read the apocryphal accounts that are additions to Esther, as they call it. And this happens to be from the complete works of Yahusuf or Josephus. Particularly, this is book 11, chapter 6 of his complete works, The Antiquities of the Yahudim, okay, it specifically. And just for the record, the Antiquities of the Yahudim is like our common scriptures. It takes place from Bereshit or Genesis all the way through to the, the times right before our Mashiach came. And then you have the next group of writings is called the War of the Yahudims, which takes place from the times of the Maccabean period or the Maccabees all the way through to after our Mashiach came and the destruction of the, the, the land by Vespasian and Titus around 70 AD. I think it goes to about 75 AD in the battles at Masada as, as well. You also have his, his, um, his discourses and arguments with Apion and his discourse to the Greeks about Hades and the similar writings like that. So that's why it's called as complete works, but this one in particular is in the Antiquities of the Yahudim. So this is concerning Esther or Chadasha and Mordecai and Haman and how in the reign of Arxerxes, the whole nation of the Yahudim was in danger of perishing. It says, after the death of Xerxes, the kingdom came to be transferred to his son, Cyrus, whom the Greeks called Art, Art Xerxes. When this man had obtained the government over the Persians, the whole nation of the Yahudim, with their wives and children, were in danger of perishing. The occasion whereof we shall declare in a little time. For it is proper in the first place to explain somewhat relating to this king and how he came to marry a Yahudi wife who was herself of the royal family also and who is related to have saved or delivered our nation. For when Artaxerxes had taken the kingdom and had set governors over the hundred and twenty and seven provinces, from India even unto Ethiopia. In the third year of his reign, he made a costly feast for his friends and for the nations of Persia. And for their governors, such a one as was proper for a king to make, when he had a mind to make a public demonstration of his riches, and this for a hundred and fourscore days after which he made a feast for other nations and for their ambassadors at Shushan for seven days. Now this feast was ordered after the manner following. He caused a tent to be pitched, which was supported by pillars of gold and silver, with curtains of linen and purple spread over them, that it might afford room for many ten thousands to sit down. The cups with which the waiters ministered were of gold and adorned with precious stones for pleasure and for sight. There's a very large footnote here I just got caught looking at, but we won't worry about it right now. 
Okay. It says, he also gave order to the servants that they should not force them to drink by bringing them wine continually, as is the practice of the Persians, but to permit every one of the guests to enjoy himself according to his own inclination. Moreover, he sent messengers through the country and gave order that they should have a remission of their labors and should keep a festival many days on account of his kingdom. In like manner did Vasti, or Vashti, the queen gather her guests together and made them a feast in the palace. Now the king was desirous to show her who exceeded all other women in beauty to those that feasted with him. And he sent some to command her to come to his feast. But she, out of regard of the laws of the Persians, which forbid the wives to be seen by strangers, did not go to the king. And though he oftentimes sent the eunuchs to her, she did nevertheless stay away and refused to come, till the king was so much irritated that he break up the entertainment and rose up and called for those seven who had the interpretation of the laws committed to them, and accused his wife and said that he had been affronted by her, because that when she was frequently called by him to his feast, she did not obey him once. He therefore gave order that they should inform him what could be done by the law against her. So one of them, whose name was Mani Mimukin, said that this affront was offered not to him alone, but to all the Persians who were in danger of leading their lives very ill with their wives, if they must be thus despised by them, for that none of their wives would have any reverence for their husbands, if they had, quote, such an example of arrogance in the queen towards you, who rules over all, unquote. Accordingly, he exhorted him to punish her, who had been guilty of so great an affront to him after a severe manner and when he had done so or and when he had so done to publish to the nations what had been decreed about the queen so the resolution was to put vasti away and to give her dignity to another woman but the king having been fond of her did not well bear a separation and yet by the law he could not admit of the reconciliation. So he was under trouble, as not having it in his power to do what he desired to do. But when his friends saw him so uneasy, they advised him to cast the memory of his wife and his love for her out of his mind, but to send abroad over all the habitable earth and to search out for comely virgins and to take her whom he should best like for his wife, because his passion for his former wife would be quenched by the introduction of another. And if you remember, this is all, everything including history is in parables. So what was happening now was indicative to the things that were going on with the truth as well. This says that there is one version of something that mentioned that he was trying to show Vasti to his guests naked, but that's nowhere actually mentioned in the scriptures or in in uh, Josephus here. And it changes the context of what was being said. It makes it seem like he was trying to get, get her to commit a sin instead of being affronted by her lack of listening to him. This is in the kindnesses or in the kindness he had for Vasti would be withdrawn from her and be placed on her that was with him. Accordingly, he was persuaded to follow this advice and gave order to certain persons to choose out of the virgins that were in his kingdom, those that were esteemed the most comely. So when a great number of these virgins were gathered together, 
there was found a damsel in Babylon, whose parents were both dead, and she was brought up with her uncle Mordecai. For that was her uncle's name. This uncle was of the tribe of Benjamin, or Benjamin, and was one of the principal persons among the Yahudim. Now it proved that this damsel, whose name was Esther, was the most beautiful of all the rest. And her name in Hebrew was Chadesha or Chadesa, right? But in, they call her Esther, which comes from Astaroth. There's a few times where this kind of phenomenon happens. Same thing with Daniel and the three wise men with him. They're all given names of the mighty ones of the Babylon instead of their own names or in sub supplanting their own names. This is now it was proved that this damsel whose name was Esther was the most beautiful of all the rest and that the favor of her countenance drew the eyes of the spectators principally upon her. So she was committed to one of the eunuchs to take the care of her and she was very exactly provided with sweet odors in great plenty and with costly ointments, such as her body required to be anointed withal. And this was used for six months by the virgins, who were in number four hundred. And when the eunuch thought the virgins had been sufficiently purified in the forementioned time, and were now fit to go to the king's bed, he sent one to be with the king every day. So when he had accompanied with her, he sent her back to the eunuch. And when Esther had come to him, he was pleased with her and fell in love with the damsel and married her and made her his lawful wife and kept a wedding feast for her on the twelfth month of the seventh year of his reign, which was called Adar. And Adar is the twelfth month after Babylonian captivity on our Creator's calendar. He also sent Angari, as they are called, or messengers, unto every nation, and gave orders that they should keep a feast for his marriage, while he himself treated the Persians and the Medes, and the principal men of the nations for a whole month on account of this his marriage. Accordingly, Esther came to his royal palace, and he set a diadem on her head. And thus was Esther married without making known to the king what nation she was derived from. Her uncle also removed from Babylon to Shushan, and dwelt there, being every day about the palace, and inquiring how the damsel did, for he loved her as though she had been his own daughter. Now the king had made a law. And there's a footnote here. It says, Herodotus, who was a Roman historian about 500 BC. Okay. But it says, Herodotus says that this law against anyone's coming uncalled to the kings of Persia when they were sitting on their thrones was first enacted by Dioses, i.e. by him who first withdrew the Medes from the dominion of the Assyrians, and himself first reigned over them. Thus also, Lays Spanheim stood guards, and with their axes about the thrones of Tennis, or Tanundus, that the offender might by them be punished immediately. And I might mention it here, but the, the laws of the Persians, if you remember during the time of Daniel, he could not, Darius couldn't change the laws that mentioned after they were established. So when he had made the decree that he had to be worshipped and no one else, and Daniel was caught worshipping the Elohim of all, he was punished for it. He was not, uh, he could not do otherwise, but he said the Elohim who you, whom you worship will deliver you. And he was miraculously delivered from the mouths of the lions, not once, but twice. The first time in the common scriptures that we're familiar with, with Darius. And the second time during the time of 
Koresh, which is mentioned in the apocryphal or the additions to Daniel called Baal and the dragon. So back on to the story here. It says, now the king had made a law that none of his own people should approach him unless he were called when he sat upon his throne and men with axes in their hands stood round about his throne in order to punish such as approached to him without being called. However, the king sat with a golden scepter in his hand, which he held out when he had a mind to deliver anyone who or any one of those that approached to him without being called. And he who touched it was free from danger. But of this matter we have discoursed sufficiently. Some time after this, two eunuchs, Big Than, Big Than and Teresh, plotted against the king, and Barnaz Bazus, the servant of one of the eunuchs, being by birth a Yahudi, was acquainted with their conspiracy and discovered it to the queen's uncle. And Mordecai, by the means of Esther, made the conspirators known to the king. This troubled the king, but he discovered the truth and hanged the eunuchs upon a stake, or a cross, it says, while at that time he gave no reward to Mordecai, who had been the occasion of his preservation. He only bid the scribes to set down his name in the records and bid him stay in the palace as an intimate friend of the king. Now there was one Haman, the son of Amid Amidatha, by birth an Amicalite. And this is something that you don't see in the common scriptures, as far as I'm aware, anywhere, that it mentions Haman as an Amicalite. But he's actually a descendant of Agag, who's the grandson of Edom, or Agag, the king of the line of the Amalite, Amicalites, and Amal Amalek was the grandson of Edom. But it says, by birth an Amicalite, that used to go into the king, and the foreigners and Persians worshipped him, as Arxerxes had commanded that such honor should be paid to him. But Mordecai was so wise and so observant of his own country's laws that he would not worship the man. When Haman observed this, he inquired whence he came, and when he comprehended or understood that he was a Yahudi, he had indignation at him, and said within himself, that whereas the Persians, who were free men, worshipped him, this man, who was no better than a slave, does not vouchsafe to do so. There's a footnote down here I want to check out real quick. It says, Whether this adoration required of Mordecai to Haman were by him deemed to be like the adoration due only to Elohim, as Yahusuf seems to here to think, as well as the Septuagint interpreters also, by their translation of Esther 13, 12 through 14, or whether he thought he ought to pay no sort of adoration to an Amicalite, which nation had been such great sinners as to have been universally devoted to destruction by Elohim himself, Exodus 17, 14 through 16, and 1 Shemuel 15, 18. Or whether both causes concurred cannot now, I doubt, be certainly determined. As far as I know, that second had never been mentioned by anyone. It's not mentioned in the Septuagint or in Josephus itself, although he is mentioned to be an Amicalite here. I'm not certain about the Septuagint version and whether or not it mentions that he's a, he's a descendant of Amalek. So that's something to look into. But getting back on track here, it says, And when he desired to punish Mordecai, he thought it too small a thing to request of the king that he alone might be punished. He rather determined to abolish the whole nation. For he was naturally an enemy to the Yahudim, because the nation of the Amicalites, or Amalekites, of which he was, 
had been destroyed by them. Accordingly, and that was, they were wiped out as being a, a separate nation of themselves, but they still had a prominence throughout the area. He was one of them, right? Accordingly, he came to the king and accused them, saying, There is a certain wicked nation, and it is dispersed over all the habitable earth that was under his dominion, a nation separate from others, unsociable, neither admitting the sort of Elohim, Elohim's worship that others do, nor using laws like to the laws of others. At enmity with your people and with all men, both in their manners and practices. Now, if you remember the foretelling against Yishmael, that he'd be a wild donkey of a man in his hand against all his neighbors and all of his neighbors are all hand against him. That was a type and picture of the original covenant believers. If you recall the, the parables that are throughout scripture and what that represents, Shaul makes this clear when he says that Hagar is the first covenant in, of Mount Sinai in Arabia, meaning that Yishmael, is the, those who hear El, is like the first covenant believers. And it's the reason why our Mashiach came to Yerushalayim riding on a donkey and the cult of a donkey, riding on these people from before and then after the Babylonian captivity. All of it foretelling in parable form the things that were had been were and would be so um just for a picture of that edom or esau is the brother that was born in the womb with yaakov and then went apostate from the belief and hated his brother from the heart and attacked him and these are the descendants of them that's reminiscent of roman catholicism what came about from there after the the overseers of rome went apostate So getting back on track here, it, just what he was writing about here, saying that they have different laws and they don't keep these things, they're, they're contrary to other men, and it was a foreshadow of the things that would come as well. Excuse me. So he says, now, if you will be the benefactor to your subjects, you will give order to destroy them utterly and not leave the least remains of them, nor preserve any of them, either for slaves or for captives. This is important to keep in mind because as you desire to do to his chosen, so it will be done unto you. You reap what you sow in the words of your own mouth or a snare to the wicked. This is what he desired to do to others, and that's what happened to him and his people at the end of this, if you recall. But that the king might not be damnified by the loss of the tributes which the Yahudim paid him, a man promised to give him out of his own estate 40,000 talents whatsoever he pleased, or whensoever he pleased. And he said he would pay this money very willingly, that the kingdom might be freed from such a misfortune. When Haman had made this petition, the king both forgave him the money and granted him the men to do what he would with them. So Haman, having gained what he desired, sent out immediately a decree, as from the king, to all nations, the contents whereof were these. Artaxerxes, the great king, to the rulers of the hundred and twenty and seven provinces from India to Ethiopia, sends this writing. Whereas I have governed many nations, and obtained the dominions of all the habitable earth, according to my desire, and have not been obliged to do anything that is insolent or cruel to my subjects by such my power, but have showed myself mild and gentle by taking care of their shalom or peace in good order, and have sought how they might enjoy those blessings or birakah for all time to come. And whereas I have been kindly informed by Haman, who on account of his prudence and justice, or righteousness, is the first in my esteem, and in dignity, and only second to myself for his fidelity and constant goodwill to me. That there is an ill-natured nation intermixed with all mankind, 
that is adverse to our laws and not subject to kings, and of a different conduct of life from others, that hates monarchy and of a disposition that is pernicious to our affairs. I give order that all these men, of whom Haman our second father has informed us, be destroyed, with their wives and children, and that none of them be spared and that none prefer pity to them before obedience to this decree. And this I will to be executed on the fourteenth day of the twelfth month in this present year, that so when all that have enmity to us are destroyed, and this in one day, we may be allowed to lead the rest of our lives in shalom or peace afterwards or hereafter. Sorry. It says, Now when this decree was brought to the cities and to the country, all were ready for the destruction and entire abolishment of the Yahudim against the day before mentioned, and they were very hasty about it at Shushan in particular. Accordingly, the king and Haman spent their time in feasting together with good cheer and wine, but the city was in disorder. Now when Mordecai was informed of what was done, he rent his clothes and put on sackcloth and sprinkled ashes upon his head, and went about the city crying out that a nation that had been injurious to no man was to be destroyed. And he went on saying thus as far as to the king's palace, and there he stood, for it was not lawful for him to go into it that in ha or to go into it in that habit, meaning he wasn't able to go into the palace in sackcloth and ashes. The same thing was done by all the Yahudim that were in the several cities wherein this decree was published, with lamentation and mourning, on account of the calamities denounced against them. But as soon as certain persons had told the queen that Mordecai stood up or stood before the court in a mourning habit, she was disturbed at that or at this report, and sent out such as should change his garments. But when he could not be induced to put off his sackcloth because the sad occasion that forced him to put it on was not yet ceased, she called the eunuchs Arcrathius, Arcrathius, yes, for he was then present, and sent him to Mordecai, in order to know of him what sad accident had befallen him for which he was in mourning, and would not put off the habit he had put on at her desire. Then Mordecai, or then did Mordecai inform the eunuch of the occasion of his mourning, and of the decree which was sent by the king into all the country, and of the promise of money hereby, or whereby rather he man, brought the destruction of their nation. He also gave him a copy of what was proclaimed at Shushan to be carried to Esther, and he charged her to petition the king about this matter, and not to think it a dishonorable thing in her to put on a humble habit for the safety of her nation, wherein she might deprecate the ruin of the Yahudim who were in danger of it, for that a man whose dignity was only inferior to that of the king, had accused the Yahudim and had irritated the king against them. When she was informed of this, she sent to Mordecai again and told him that she was not called by the king and that he who goes into him without being called is to be slain unless when he is willing to save anyone, he holds out his golden scepter to him, but that to whomsoever he does so, although he go in without being called, that person is so far from being slain that he obtains pardon and is entirely preserved. Now when the eunuch carried this message from Esther to Mordecai, he bade him also to tell her that she must not only provide for her own preservation, but for the common preservation of her nation, for that if she now neglected this opportunity, 
there would certainly arise help to them from Elohim some other way. But she and her father's house would be destroyed by those whom she now despised. But Esther sent the very same eunuch back to Mordecai to desire him to go to Shushan and to gather the Yahudim that were there together to a congregation and to fast and abstain from all sorts of food on her account and to let him know that she with her maidens would do the same. And then she promised that she would go to the king, though it were against the law, and that if she must die for it, she would not refuse it. So, Ab willing, you guys can see the parallels in here with, like, the believer's experience. You have imminent death as a threat over you, but you humble yourself by fasting and prayer before you go before him. This is like the, the, what, early believers were enjoined to do fasting before their immersion to die with Mashiach and coming back for the deliverance and then through love serving one another. It, there's a lot of parallels like that here that pretty well shine. It says, accordingly, Mordecai did as Esther had enjoined him and made the people fast and he besought Elohim together with them not to overlook his nation, particularly at this time when it was going to be destroyed, but that as he had often before provided for them and forgiven when they had sinned, so he would now deliver them from that destruction which was denounced against them. For although it was not all the nation that had offended, yet must they so in gloriously or ignobly be slain and that he was himself the occasion of the wrath of Haman because said he I did not worship him nor could I endure to pay that honor to him which I used to pay to you Yahuwah for upon this or for upon that his anger has he contrived this present mischief against those that have not transgressed your laws so a descendant of Edom of the royal line of the Amicalites there wanted to be worshipped like Elohim as a man, which is exactly what you see in the foretold shadow of the Edomites with the, the Bishop of Rome. And the ones that would not do so were persecuted and, and wiped out in the same manner later on. Hopefully, or Ab willing, you can see those pictures also playing out here too, right? It says, the same supplications did the multitude put up and entreated that Elohim would provide for their deliverance and free the Yisraeli that were in all the earth from this calamity, which was now coming upon them, for they had it before their eyes and expected its coming. Accordingly, Esther made supplication to Elohim after the manner of her country by casting herself down upon the earth and putting on her mourning garments, and bidding farewell to meat and drink, and all delicacies, for three days' time. And she entreated Elohim to have mercy upon her, and to make her words appear persuasive to the king, and render her countenance more beautiful than it was before, that both by her words and beauty she might succeed. It mentions in the Testament of Yahusuf that those who fast and afflict themselves for the sake of Yahuwah and his ways and way are more beautiful and beautified because of it. And that's why he was an attractive young man that, that unfortunately, or the way it had turned about, enticed the Mitzriite woman, the wife of Pontifar there. But that both by her words and her beauty she might succeed. For the averting of the king's anger, in case he were at all irritated against her, and for the consolation of those of her own country, now they were in the utmost danger of perishing, as also that he would excite a hatred in the king against the enemies of the Yahudim, and those that had contrived their future destruction, if they proved to be contemned by him. <clears throat> 
When Esther had used this supplication for three days, she put off those garments and changed her habit, and adorned herself as became a queen, and took two of her handmaids with her, the one of which supported her as she gently leaned upon her, and the other followed after, and lifted up her large train, which swept along the ground, with the extremities of her fingers. And thus she came to the king, having a blushing redness in her countenance, with a pleasant, with a pleasant agreeableness in her behavior. Yet did she go in to him with fear. And as soon as she was come over against him, he was sitting on his throne in his royal apparel, which was a garment interwoven with gold and precious stones which made him seem to her more terrible, especially when he looked at her somewhat severely, and with a countenance of fire, or on fire with anger. Her joints failed her immediately, out of the dread she was in, and she fell down sideways in a swoon. But the king changed his mind, which happened, as I suppose, by the will of Elohim, and was concerned for his wife lest her fear should bring some very ill thing upon her. And he leaped from his throne and took her in his arms and recovered her by embracing her and speaking comfortably to her and exhorting her to be of good cheer and not to suspect anything that was sad on account of her coming to him without being called. Because that law was made for subjects, but that she who was a queen as well as he, a king, might be entirely secure. And as he said this, he put the scepter into her hand and laid his rod upon her cheek on account of the law, and so freed her from fear. And after she had recovered herself by these encouragements, she said, My master, it is not easy for me on the sudden to say what has happened. For as soon as I saw you to be great and comely and terrible, my ruach or spirit departed from me, and I had no soul left in me. And while it was with difficulty and in a low voice that she could say th thus much, the king was in a great agony and disorder, and encouraged Esther to be of good cheer and to expect better fortune, since he was ready, if occasion should require it, to grant her the half of his kingdom. Accordingly, Esther desired that he and his friend Haman would come to her to a banquet, for she said she had prepared a supper for him. He consented to it, and when they were there, as they were drinking, he bid Esther to let him know what she desired for that she should not be disappointed, though she should desire the half of his kingdom. But she put off the discovery of her petition till the next day, if he would come again, together with a man, to her banquet. <clears throat> now when the king had promised so to do, a man went away very glad, because he alone had the honor of supping with the king at Esther's banquet and because no one else partook of the same honor with kings but himself. Yet when he saw Mordecai in the court, he was very much displeased, for he paid him no manner of respect when he saw him. So he went home and called for his wife Zeresh and his friends, and when they were come, he showed them what honor he enjoyed not only from the king, but also the queen, or but from the queen also. For as he alone had that day supped with her together with the king, so was he also invited again for the next day. Yet said he, Am I not pleased to see Mordecai the Yahudi in the court? Hereupon his wife Zeresh advised him to give order that a gallows should be made fifty cubits high, and that in the morning he should ask it of the king that Mordecai might be hanged thereon. 
So he commended her advice and gave order to his servants to prepare the gallows and to place it in the court for the punishment of Mordecai thereon, which was accordingly prepared. But Elohim laughed to scorn the wicked expectations of Haman, and he knew, and this might seem a little weird, but he says he mocks those who mock him, right? Deuteronomy 32 also goes into that. Right here. This is, and as he knew what the event would be, he was delighted at it. For that night he took away the king's sleep. And as the king was not willing to lose the time of his laying awake, but to spend it in something that might be of advantage to his kingdom, he commanded the scribe to bring him the chronicles of the former kings and the records of his own actions. And when he had brought them and was reading them, one was found to have received a country on account of his excellent management on a certain occasion. And the name of the country was set down. Another was found to have had a present made him on account of his fidelity. Then the scribe came to Bigthan and Teresh, the eunuchs that had made a conspiracy against the king, which Mordecai had discovered. And when the scribe said no more but that, and was going on to another history, the king stopped him and inquired whether it was not added that Mordecai had a reward given him. And when he said that there was no such addition, he bade him leave off, and he inquired of those that were appointed for that purpose what hour of the night it was. And when he was informed that it was already day, he gave order that if they found any one of his friends already come and standing before the court, they should tell him. Now it happened that Haman was found there, for he was come sooner than ordinary to petition the king to have Mordecai put to death. And when the servants said to, that Haman was before the court, he bid them call him in. And when he was come in, he said, Because I know that you are my only fast friend, I desire you to give me advice how I may honor one that I greatly love, and that after a manner suitable to my magnificence. Now Haman reasoned with himself that what opinion he should give it would be for himself, since it was he alone who was beloved by the king. So he gave that advice which he thought of all other the best. For he said, If you would truly honor a man whom you may or whom you say that you do love, give order that he may ride on horseback with the same garment on which you wear and with a gold chain about his neck, and let one of your intimate friends go before him and proclaim through the whole city that whosoever the king honors obtains this mark of his honor. This was the advice which Haman gave out of a, a supposal that such a reward would come to himself. Hereupon the king was pleased with the advice and said, Go you therefore, for you have the horse the garment, and the chain. Ask for Mordecai, the Yahudi, and give him those things, and go before his horse and proclaim accordingly, for you are, said he, my intimate friend, and have given me good advice. Be you then the minister of what you have advised to me. Now, it doesn't go right for those that... And remember, for Yahuda, whoever curses you is a curse, and whoever barocks you is Baruch. And you can see that, that his expectations are being thwarted in such a manner. It says, This shall be his reward from, from us for preserving my life. When he had heard this order, which was entirely unexpected, he was confounded in his mind and knew not what to do. However, he went out and led the horse and took the purple garment and the golden chain for the neck, and finding Mordecai before the court clothed in sackcloth, he bid him to put that garment off and put the purple garment on. But Mordecai, 
not knowing the truth of the matter, but thinking that it was done in mockery, said, You wretch, the vilest of all mankind, do you thus laugh at our calamities? But when he was satisfied that the king bestowed this honor upon him for the deliverance he had procured him when he convicted the eunuchs who had conspired against him, he put on that purple garment, which the king always wore, and put the chain about his neck and got on horseback, and went round the city, while his man went before and proclaimed, This shall be the reward which the king will bestow on every one whom he loves and esteems worthy of honor. And when they had gone round the city, Mordecai went in to the king, but his man went home out of shame and informed his wife and friends of what had happened, and with tear, er, and this with tears, who said that he would never be able to be revenged of Mordecai, for that Elohim was with him. Now while these men were thus talking to one to another, Esther's eunuchs hastened Haman away to come to supper. But one of the eunuchs named Sabachatus, Sabu Chadas saw the gallows that was fixed in Haman's house and inquired of one of his servants for what purpose they had prepared it. So he knew that it was for the queen's uncle because Haman was about to petition the king that he might be punished. But at present he held his shalom or peace. Now when the king with Haman were at the banquet, he desired the queen to tell him what gifts she desired to obtain, and assured her that he should or that she should have whatsoever she had a mind to. She then lamented the danger her people were in, and said that she and her nation were given up to be destroyed, and that she, on that account, made this her petition, that she would not have troubled him if he had only given order that they should be sold into bitter servitude, for such a misfortune would not have been intolerable, but she desired that they might be delivered from such destruction. And when the king inquired of her whom was the author of this misery to them, she then openly accused a man and convicted him that he had been the wicked instrument of this, and had formed this plot against them. When the king was hereupon in disorder, and was gone hastily out of the banquet into the gardens, the man began to intercede with Esther, and to beseech her to forgive him as to what he had offended. For he perceived that he was in a very bad case. And as he had fallen upon the queen's bed and was making supplication to her, the king came in and being still more provoked at what he saw. Oh, you wretch, said he, you vilest of mankind, do you aim to force in my wife? And when Haman was astonished at this and not able to speak one word more, Sabacharas or Sabuchadas, the eunuch came in and accused a man, and said he found a gallows at his house prepared for Mordecai, for that the servant told him so much upon his inquiry, when he was sent to call to him to supper. He said further that the gallows was fifty cubits high, which when the king heard, he determined that a man should be punished after no other manner, than that which had been devised by him against Mordecai. So he gave order immediately that he should be hung upon those gallows and be put to death after the manner, or after that manner. And from hence I cannot forbear to admire Elohim and to learn hence his hokma or wisdom and his righteousness, not only in punishing the wickedness of Haman, but in so disposing it, that he should undergo the very same punishment which he had contrived for another. Which scripture says that the, the snare that you lay for another, that is the one your own foot's caught in. right? The, the stone you roll up it falls back on you. 
The things you plot against another is what's going to happen to you. Another witness for that is in the parable after, after Dawid did what he did with Bathsheba, Nathan gave him a parable and the words that he spoke in judgment against that man, Nathan said that man was you and these things were going to happen to him based on the words that came out of his own mouth and doing to him what he had done to another. So you can see these things play out in truth, which is what Yahusuf is alluding to here. As also, because thereby he teaches others this lesson, that what mischiefs anyone prepares against another, he, without knowing of it, first contrives it against himself. Wherefore, a man who had immoderately abused the honor he had from the king was destroyed after this manner, and the king granted his estate to the queen. He also called for Mordecai, for Esther had informed him that she was akin to him, meaning relation, right? And gave that ring that Mordecai, or to Mordecai, which he had before given to Haman. The queen also gave Haman's estate to Mordecai and prayed the king to deliver the nation of the Yahudim from fear or from the fear of death and showed him what had been written over all the country by Haman, the son of Aman, Amanidatha. For that if her country were destroyed and her countrymen were to perish, she could not bear to live herself any longer. So the king promised her that he would not do anything that should be disagreeable to her, nor contradict what she desired. But he bid her write what she pleased about the Yahudim in the king's name, and seal it with his seal, and send it to all his kingdom. For that those who read epistles whose authority is secured by having the king's seal to them would no way contradict what was written therein. So he commanded the king's scribe to be sent for, and to write to the nations on the Yahudim's behalf and to his lieutenants and governors that were over his hundred and twenty and seven provinces from India to Ethiopia. Now the contents of this epistle were these. The great king Artaxerxes to our rulers, and those that are our trustworthy or faithful subjects, send greeting. Many men there are who, on account of the greatness of the benefits bestowed on them, and because of the honor which they have obtained from this wonderful kind treatment of those that bestowed it, are not only injurious to their inf inferiors, but do not scruple to do evil to those that have been their benefactors, as if they should take away or would take away gratitude from among men and by their insolent abuse of such benefits as they never expected, they turn the abundance they have against those that are the authors of it. And suppose they shall lie concealed from Elohim in that case, and avoid that vengeance which comes from him. Some of these men, when they have had the management of affairs committed to them by their friends, and bearing private malice of their own against some others, by deceiving those that have the power, persuade them to be angry at such as have done them no harm, till they were in danger of perishing, and this by laying accusations and colonies, or colonies, sorry. Nor is this state of things to be discovered by ancient examples, or such as we have learned by report only but by some examples of such impudent attempts under our own eyes, so that it is not fit to attend any longer to colonies and accusations, nor to the persuasions of others, but to determine what anyone knows of himself to have been really a done, sorry, to, to have been really done, and to punish what justly or righteously deserves it, and to grant favors to such as are innocent. This has been the case of Haman, the son of Amidatha, by birth an Amicalite, 
an alien from the blood of the Persians, who, when he was hospitably entertained by us and partook of that kindness which we bear to all men to so great a degree as to be called my father and to be all along worshipped, and to have honor paid him by all in the second rank after the royal honor due to ourselves, he could not bear his good fortune, nor govern the magnitude of his prosperity with sound reason. Nay, he made a conspiracy against me and my wife, who gave him his authority by endeavoring to take away Mordecai, my benefactor, and my deliverer, and by basely and treacherously requiring to have Esther, the partner of my life and of my dominion, brought to destruction. For he contrived by this means to deprive me of my trustworthy friends and transfer the government to others. But since I perceive that these Yahudim that were by this pernicious fellow devoted to destruction were not wicked men, but conducted their lives after the best manner, and were men dedicated to the worship of that Elohim who has preserved the kingdom to me and to my ancestors. I do not only free them from the punishment which the former epistle, which was sent by Haman, ordered to be inflicted on them, to which if you refuse obedience you shall do well. But I will that they have all honor paid to them, Accordingly, I have hanged up the man that contrived such things against them, with his family, before the gates of Shushan, that punishment being sent upon him by Elohim who sees all things. And I give you in charge that you publicly propose a copy of this epistle through all my kingdom, that the Yahudim may be permitted peaceably to use their own laws, and that you assist them that at the same season thereto their miserable estate did belong. They may defend themselves the very same day from unrighteous violence, the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is Adar. And that would have been yesterday on our Creator's calendar as we reckon it. For Elohim has made that day a day of deliverance instead of a day of destruction to them. And may it be a good day to those that wish us well, and a memorial of the punishment of the co-conspirators against us. And I will that you take notice that every city and every nation that shall disobey anything that is contained in this epistle shall be destroyed by fire and sword. However, let this epistle be published through all the country that is under our obedience, and let all the Yahudim, by all means, be ready against the day before mentioned, that they may avenge themselves upon their enemies. <clears throat> Accordingly, the horsemen who carried the epistle proceeded on their ways which they were to go with speed. But as for Mordecai, as soon as he had assumed the royal garment and the crown of gold and had put the chain about his neck, he went forth in a public procession. And when the Yahudim who were at Shushan saw him in so great honor with the king, they thought his good fortune was common to themselves also. And joy and a beam of salvation or deliverance encompassed the Yahudim, both those that were in the cities and those that were in the countries. So when one is exalted, they all rejoice, just like it's enjoined in the scriptures, right? Upon the publication of the king's letters, insomuch that many, even of other nations, circumcised the foreskin for the fear of the Yahudim, that they might procure safety to themselves thereby. For on the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which according to the Hebrews is called Adar, but according to the Macedonians, Destrus, those that carried the king's epistle gave them notice that the same day wherein their danger was to have been, on that very day, should they destroy their enemies. Now, in the common scriptures, if I recall correctly, 
they were to do this the day before it was appointed for them to be destroyed by Haman, which would have been today. And they ended up doing it on the 13th and the 14th in Susan the second time. And because it was done on both days, they kept the feast for two days, the 14th and the 15th. But getting back on track. It says, but now the rulers of the provinces and the tyrants and the kings and the scribes had the Yahudim in esteem. For the fear they were in of Mordecai forced them to act with discretion. Now, when the royal decree was come to all the country that was subject to the king, it fell out that the Yahudim at Shushan slew 500 of their enemies. And when the king had told Esther the number of those that were slain in the city, but did not well know what had been done in the provinces, he asked her whether she would have anything further done against them, for that it should be done accordingly. Upon which she desired that the Yahudim might be permitted to treat their remaining enemies in the same manner the next day, as also that they might hang the ten sons of Haman upon the gallows. So the king permitted the Yahudim so to do, as desirous not to contradict Esther. So they gathered themselves, and remember, Haman wanted to wipe them out as a man, all of the nation of the Yahudim, so he himself lost all his posterity, and he no longer continued along with his nation. So they gathered themselves together again on the 14th day of the month Destrus, or Adar, which is the 12th month, and slew about 300 of their enemies, but touched nothing of what riches they had. Now there were slain by the Yahudim that were in the country and in the other cities, 75,000 of their enemies. And these were slain on the 13th day of the month. And the next day they kept as a festival. In like manner, the Yahudim that were in Shushan gathered themselves together and feasted on the fourteenth day, and that which followed it. Whence it is that even now all the Yahudim that are in the habitable earth keep these days festival and send portions to one another. Mordecai also wrote to the Yahudim that lived in the kingdom of Arxerxes to observe these days and celebrate them as festivals and to deliver them down to posterity that this festival might continue for all time to come and that it might never be buried in oblivion. For since they were about to be destroyed on these days by Haman, they would do a right thing upon escaping the danger in them and on them inflicting punishment on their enemies to observe those days and give thanks to Elohim on them, for which cause the Yahudim still keep the aforementioned days and call them days of Purim or Purim. And Mordecai became a great and illustrious person with the king and assisted him in the government of the people. He also lived with the queen so that the affairs of the Yahudim were by their means, better than they could ever have hoped for. And this was the state of the Yahudim under the reign of Artaxerxes. So thank you for allowing me to read that. We see that it does not carry over the apocryphal parts of the uh, account of Esther, where he had the vision beforehand, and then the, the remembrance of it afterwards. So maybe we'll cover that later. All right, so we're going to end for today, and we'll continue with the Book of Hanok or whatever we have going for us next week. You all have a wonderful Shabbat and Shavuot the rest of the week ahead. Yahuwah be with you.